Welcome to this week's online chapel. This week, we get to hear from our very own Dr. Matthew Emerson as he brings this year's Hobbs Lecture. Dr. Emerson is now in his sixth year here at OBU and serves as the Dean of the Hobbs College of Theology and Ministry. Dr. Emerson earned an MDiv and PhD from Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary in Wake Forest, North Carolina. Also, just a reminder that this week's chapel is not the last one of the semester. Our final chapel will be next Wednesday, November 18th at 10 a.m. All students will have the normal time constraints to finish the quiz. However, if you are a graduating senior, you need to complete your credit by Friday morning at 8 a.m. if that credit is needed to satisfy your chapel requirements for graduation. This will ensure that you'll be able to participate in the graduation ceremony. Thanks so much and have a blessed day. Hello and greetings from Bison Hill. My name is Matt Emerson. I'm the Dean of the Hobbs School of uh, Theology and Ministry at OBU and want to welcome you to our annual Hobbs Lecture Series. Uh, the Hobbs Lecture is named for the same person that the Hobbs College is named after, Herschel Hobbs, who was a prominent Baptist in Oklahoma, pastor of First Baptist Oklahoma City for a number of years and uh, prominent in the Southern Baptist Convention as well. This lecture is named after him, the series, and it's designed to promote a deeper understanding of Baptist history and theology uh, to Oklahoma Baptists and to Southern Baptists and to other interested listeners. And so each year we have a particular speaker who gives a paper on a topic of interest related to Baptist history and theology, and so this year I'm going to deliver that lecture, and I'll be speaking to us today about Benjamin Keach's use of the Old Testament. And I should warn you, if you're a student and you're used to listening right now, at least to 25-minute chapel messages, this is going to be a bit different today. Uh, this is more of an academic lecture, so uh, buckle up. As a 17th century British particular Baptist, Benjamin Keach, who lived from 1640 to 1704, lived among one of the only generations of Baptists to exist prior to the Enlightenment. Although his life spanned nearly the exact same time frame as John Locke, the latter's writings had not yet achieved the prominence they would in the 18th century, nor were David Hume or Immanuel Kant yet on the scene. Keech's writings therefore exhibit a model of Baptist life that has since been largely lost, a mode that still gave explicit credit to the early and medieval Christian tradition, and one that was influenced by pre-modern exegetical methods as well as by Renaissance, Reformation, and early modern sentiments. Exploration of his interpretive method, and particularly his use of the Old Testament, will give us insight into how the earliest Baptists viewed Scripture and its proper interpretation. In this paper, I'm going to argue that Keech uses the Old Testament in distinctive ways, and I list three of those. Uh, Catholic, and I don't mean by that, and I'll say this a few times, I don't mean by Catholic, Roman Catholic. I mean Catholic with a small c, which just means universally Christian. Catholic, Reformational, and Baptist modes of interpretation. And in each of these modes arise from a commitment to Scripture as the Spirit-inspired Word of God given to and for the people of God throughout space and time. In order to assess Keech's use of the Old Testament, I'll begin by describing it in his various corpora, catechetical works, doctrinal and polemical works, devotional works, and interpretive works. The latter category includes works about interpretive theory as well as interpretation in practice, in other words, commentaries, sermons, and hymns. Uh, two caveats about the sources I'm going to cite. First, because of the sheer volume of Keech's published work, I have limited my consideration uh, to representative works in each category. Second, I've mostly left out consideration of his Tropologia, both because that could be an entire essay in its own right, given the treatise's size, it's almost a thousand pages, uh, and also because it's more theory than it is praxis. Uh, but my aim here is to survey what he actually does in practice in his sermons and essays. And so back to the thesis. In surveying his use of the Old Testament in these works, we will see that Keech has a Catholic, again, small c, universally Christian spirit with respect to his acknowledgement of the Christological and tropological senses of Scripture, a reformational spirit with respect to his elevation of Scripture as the supreme revelation of God and thus superior over church tradition, and able to correct it when necessary, and a Baptist spirit, spirit with respect to his understanding of the relation between the Old and New Covenants. And so to begin, I'll just survey uh, his various writings. He was one of the most prolific Baptist writers in the 17th century, 
and really uh, one of the most prolific Baptist writers ever. And so it's not possible to assess every one of his works. Instead, I've selected them from three different genres, doctrinal and catechetical works, devotional works, and hermeneutical and homiletical works. To begin with, his doctrinal and catechetical writings. Uh, perhaps because of his status as a prominent particular Baptist in early British Baptist life, Keats wrote a number of works intended to pr promote and defend both Protestant and Baptist beliefs. These included catechisms, doctrinal treatises, and polemical works. Regarding instruction, Keats's catechism is one of the most well-known Baptist catechisms, but it doesn't contain many explicit references or allusions to Scripture. Uh, the only explicit citations of Scripture are the set of extended questions on the Ten Commandments and the inclusion of the full text of the Lord's Prayer, the Great Commandments, and the Ten Commandments as an appendix. Uh, of course, one could, view that, uh, one could argue that Keats viewed his catechism as an accurate doctrinal summary of Scripture and a faithful teaching mechanism for those learning that summary, but this doesn't really tell us anything about how, much, or how he was using the Old Testament. Uh, but the rest of his work, and especially in including his doctrinal and polemical works, is really much more saturated with explicit scripture references than is his catechism. It might be appropriate to begin with his view of scripture, discussed in numerous places but most systematically articulated in his work called The Scriptures Superior to All Spiritual Manifestations. This text is a reflection on the nature of the Bible, both in general and in response to an apparent wave of claims of immediate revelations and apparitions of the dead. So people were saying, hey, the dead are appearing and saying stuff. Uh, his basic argument is that all Scripture is superior to private words and to necromancy because all Scripture is inspired and able to teach us what we need for faith and practice. Or, in his own words, and here I'm quoting him, that way or that means which God hath ordained or appointed as the ordinary and most effectual way or means for the conversion of sinners hath a divine power and efficacy in it above all or any other way or means whatsoever to effect that great end. But God hath ordained the sacred scriptures as read, especially as preached by his faithful ministers, as the ordinary way and most effectual means for the conversion of sinners. Therefore the scriptures, as so read and preached, have a real and divine power and efficacy, efficacy above all or any other means whatever to effect that great end. He relies here on standard texts to discuss the nature of Scripture, such as 2 Timothy 3, 14-17 and 2 Peter 1, 21, in making his argument. But of particular note for our purposes are his references to Luke 16, 31 and John 5, 46. The former, with which he opens and closes the treatise, contains Jesus' pronouncement that, quote, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. And I'm quoting there from the Christian Standard Bible. In his Closing quotation of this verse, Keech inserts the parenthetical metonym, quote, or Christ's written word, end quote, after the phrase, quote, Moses and the prophets. In other words, he's equating Christ's written word with Moses and the prophets. Earlier in the same section, Keech also refers to Isaiah 8, 19 to 20, 1 Timothy 3, 14 through 15, and John 5, 46, in order to make the point that if one does not know and understand and believe Holy Scripture, and particularly in the context uh, of each of those verses, and especially latter, the latter two, the Old Testament, one cannot and will not believe in the risen Christ. In other words, Keech places high priority on God's Word, both the New Testament and the Old Testament, as the means of knowing and understanding the risen Christ. One final point from this text regarding Keech's doctrine of Scripture that helps us understand his use of the Old Testament is his discussion of the Analogia Fide or the analogy of faith. Again, this is set in the context of polemicizing, quote, private interpretations, but it nevertheless gives us an idea of how Keech reads Scripture. He says, quote, No one place of the Scriptures is to be interpreted by men's own spirits, or is of any private interpretation, contrary to what is conf confirmed by other Scriptures. God, being the author of it, all agrees and sweetly harmonizes. For the Scripture may be understood of the ignorant, by comparing one scripture with another, and the scripture itself is the best interpreter of scripture. In other words, because of its divine author, scripture has a cohesive meaning and can be understood by comparing one part with another part. Bearing in mind then these bibli bibliological commitments, we can examine Keech's other doctrinal and polemical works, as well as his devotional and homiletical works later, with a better understanding of his basic approach to reading scripture, which I summarize as this. It is one book with one author, about one person, Jesus Christ.
So other than the massive hermeneutical tome, Tropologia, Keech expended much of his writing energies on the issue of baptism. This is, of course, understandable given his context, but we should not pass over works like Gold Refined or The Axe Laid to Its Root simply as defenses of credo-baptism. They are certainly that, but for our purposes, they are also filled with abundant and variegated uses of the Old Testament. In Gold Refined, to take the larger and more quote-unquote academic of the two, Keech cites the Old Testament in a number of different ways. He begins the treatise with a quotation of Isaiah 1.22, quote, Thy silver has become dross, and then launches into a discussion of the meaning of the word baptize. One might think that this discussion would be confined to New Testament references, or possibly to those and maybe Second Temple Jewish and Greco-Roman uses of the term as well. But the first scripture that Keech cites, while crediting Ainsworth for the observation, is Leviticus 15.5 in defense of washing the entire body rather than simply sprinkling. This kind of definitional function of the Old Testament, where Old Testament texts are used in support of word definitions and the like, occurs throughout the book. One especially pertinent example is his discussion of the Hebrew word tabal and the Septuagint's translation of it with the Greek word baptizo. He argues that the latter clarifies that the former means to dip, and cites Genesis 37, 31, Exodus 12, 22, Leviticus 4, 6, uh, Leviticus 17, 4, Deuteronomy 33, 24, Numbers 16, 18, and 2 Kings 5, 14 in support. He also cites the Old Testament on a number of occasions in, in support of particular doctrinal concepts and conclusions. Additionally, Keech frequently employs uh, typological reading strategies and focuses much of his attention on the relation between the Old and New Covenants. In these respects, Keech reads the Old Testament with exegetical acumen, use of the Analogia Fide, a commitment to the Old Testament's conceptual coherence with the New Testament, and a credo-Baptist understanding of the relation between the covenants. In addition to reading the Old Testament in order to understand and in relation to the New Testament, Keech also demonstrates a willingness to read it with a Christological referent, tropological immediacy, and an eschatological end. Uh, I should say, just to clarify those terms, by Christological referent, I mean he's willing to read the Old Testament as speaking about Jesus. By tropological immediacy, I mean that he's willing to read the Old Testament as applying directly to New Testament believers. And by eschatological end, I mean that he's willing to read the Old Testament as teaching us about what is to come in the future. These are, these, all three of these are, of course, related to his defense of credo-baptism, as it's in Gold Refined that he's doing this. But Keech employs remarkably Catholic, again, small c, that is universally Christian, interpretive maneuvers in doing so. The Christological and sometimes ecclesiological, via the body of Christ concept, referent of particular Old Testament texts, <clears throat> excuse me, is not always tied to a typological thread or to a New Testament quotation of an Old Testament verse. Sometimes, Keech simply asserts, without qualification or even much argumentation, that an Old Testament text is about Christ and or his church. Other times, he uses an early Christian interpretive practice, now called prosopological exegesis, to claim that the Son is the speaker in particular Old Testament texts. For example, Keech sees Jesus as the speaker in Psalm 42.7, which he uh, translates as, Thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. And by the way, uh, just to give you an example of Keech reading an Old Testament text as simply just about Jesus or his church, uh, in Gold Refined, he assumes that John the Baptist is the messenger of Malachi 3.1. Uh, and to give you an example of um, just a typological relationship that he sees, uh, he, he sees the, the relationship between baptism and Noah and the ark as well as baptism and Exodus and baptism and Jonah as a particular typological thread to untangle in order to understand baptism. Uh, another way in which Keech's reading of the Old Testament harkens back to early Christian interpretation is through his insistence on the tropological immediacy of the Old Testament. That is, Keech reads Old Testament texts as if they are written directly to the church in his own time. One example comes in his discussion of what is permissible in worship. Here, Keech employs Leviticus 10, verses 1 and 2, and Zechariah 14, 20, 
to argue that simply because Scripture does not prohibit particular practices, or simply because it mentions others, does not mean that either those practices that are not expressly forbidden or those that are merely mentioned are permissible for New Covenant Church worship practices. In other words, he draws directly on discussion of Israelite rituals and applies them to conversations about the regulative principle in 17th century Baptist life. Another important example with respect to his arguments for baptism, and for our purposes here, is his discussion of the typology of baptism. Keech, addressing the Pado baptist argument that infants were brought through the Red Sea, which is a type of baptism, argues that the Exodus event was merely, quote, tropically called baptism. If that may justify infant baptism, it will allow you to baptize unbelievers also, besides much cattle. In other words, Keech can read the Exodus event as both instructive for the church in that it helps us understand baptism, and also typologically connected to, but also distinct from, the actual practice and theology of credo-baptism. An additional example of this combination of typology and tropology is his use of Ishmael and Absalom as examples of children of covenanted and faithful Israelites with unbelieving children cut off in one way or the other from the Abrahamic covenant. Finally, although less prominently in Gold Refined, Keech also sees Scripture as a whole narrative that culminates in Christ's return and his establishment of the new heavens and new earth in which he reigns with his saints forever. Old Testament texts find their ultimate fulfillment in this eschatological reality. Now, moving on to another work. Uh, while the Acts laid to the root is technically a pair of sermons on Matthew 3.10, I'm going to consider it here rather than below with uh, other sermons that Keech preaches because it's really more of a treatise and because it's very similar to Gold Refined. Um, both these two sermons and Gold Refined contain many of the same Old Testament reading strategies. One might even say that the sermons, in many ways, are like a summary of the treatise. Keech focuses his attention and acts on the relationship between the covenants, since this is the linchpin of a hermeneutical defense of credo baptism. But he also once again reads the Old Testament as about Christ and his church, for the people of God throughout space and time, and having an eschatological end. One particular example is worth mentioning. In Sermon 1, Keech asks what the Acts is in Matthew 3.10. He gives a number of options, one of which is, quote, men whom God makes use of as instruments in his hand to cut down and destroy a wicked and God-provoking people. Keech mentions kings and rulers in this regard, but goes on to say that, quote, moreover, God's Israel is called his acts, and cites Jeremiah 51, 20 and 24 in support. He finishes that paragraph by referring to Daniel 3, verses 34 and 44, and the, quote, stone cut out of the mountains without hands, that will, quote, break to pieces all the powers of the earth that oppose Christ's kingdom or that stand in the way of its establishment. What we see here is an ecclesiological referent, that is a reference to Christ's church, from Old Testament prophetic texts that refer to Israel. Keech appears willing to read the Old Testament as having a Christological referent both with respect to Christ himself and to his body, his bride, the church. Another text that is related to the baptism discussion through its treatment of covenant, but that is about much more than the relation between the Old and New Covenants, is a work called The Everlasting Covenant. In this treatise, Keech explains the covenant of redemption, or Pactum Salutis, which includes discussion of the relation between the Old and New Covenants, but is mostly concerned with whether or not the covenant of redemption is the same as the covenant of grace, which, for those interested, Keech thinks they are the same. In arguing that the covenant of redemption is the same covenant as the covenant of grace, Keech relies heavily on the Old Testament prophetic texts, namely Ezekiel 36 and Isaiah 44. He also employs Old Testament texts repeatedly in explaining both the Christological relation between the Old, Te Old Testament covenants, that is the Adamic, Abrahamic, and Davidic, and the continuity between, uh, that exists between them. As with Gold Refined, Keech does not limit his comments on the Old Testament merely to the relation between the covenants, though. There are repeated references to the Old Testament that relate to his main argument, but also demonstrate how Keech reads the Old Testament in general. He cites Old Testament texts in order to demonstrate the doctrinal coherence of the Old Testament and New Testament, and also to prove the doctrinal points he makes. For instance, uh, he cites Psalm 110, verse 3, 
uh, which reads, Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power. Uh, in the King James, that's, Thy people shall be willing on the day of thy power. He quotes that text in support of his argument that human, uh, that human beings uh, need the Spirit to regenerate their hearts. Keech also reads the Old Testament Christologically and in a few different ways in this work. He relies heavily on typology, especially with respect to David. Uh, another Christological reading strategy employed by Keech is prosopological exegesis. He parses out the speakers in texts like Zechariah 6, verses 12 and 13, and Proverbs 8, 31. Regarding the latter text, Keech also reads it in its canonical context, reading it intertextually with Daniel 9, Isaiah 42, Isaiah 49, and Isaiah 50. In addition to these typological and prosopological Christ-centered readings, Keech also simply reads Christ as the direct referent of certain Old Testament texts. For instance, while discussing the Son's willingness to become incarnate out of love for his creation, Keech quotes a small part of Daniel 9.24, quote, He overcame sin, and then says of Jesus that he, quote, "...made an end of sin as to its killing and soul-condemning power." Daniel 9.24 is both quoted here and cited in support of the gloss Keech bakes on it. And both the quote and gloss are understood as direct references to Jesus. Another example of this kind of reading is in Keech's citation of Isaiah 27.4, quote, "...fury is not in me." Keech cites this verse to support the fact that, quote, "...Jesus Christ has so pacified God's wrath, end quote, through his death." In Everlasting Covenant, then, there is, again, an immediate tropological immediacy uh, to, to Keech's Old Testament interpretation. Keech refers to texts like Zechariah 9.11, 1 Samuel 30, verse 6, Hosea 14.4, and Isaiah 55, 1-8 as speaking directly of the church. Those familiar with these texts will perhaps find this almost incredulous. Because modern biblical scholars have so separated the original audience of particular books from the ecclesial audience, that is, the people of God, throughout space and time. But Keech feels no qualms about reading disparate Old Testament texts from different eras of Israel's history and prior to the coming of Christ as speaking directly to and about Christ's church. The Zechariah text is cited in support of God making alive and quickening sinners, while 1 Samuel 30 verse 6, a text about David being comforted by God, through remembering his covenant with him, even while he's being pursued by Saul, is compared to believers being comforted by God, reminding them of the covenant of grace. Hosea 14.4 reminds Christians that God will forgive repentant backsliders, while Isaiah 55 verse 1 and following is cited as, quote, a cordial for heartbroken sinners, end quote. Keats does much the same with various other texts throughout the work, including Psalm 89.29, the rest of Hosea 14, Psalm 138, verse 7, Psalm 132, verse 5, Psalm 37, verse 24, Jeremiah 32, 40, Ezekiel 16, Isaiah 55, 1 and 2, and Isaiah 57, 1 and 2. Perhaps the most fascinating aspect of this litany of texts is the repeated reference to the Psalms as written to Christians. For Keech, the audience of the Psalms is Christ's church. Keech relies on the Old Testament and other treatises about other doctrines, including the marrow of true justification concerning the doctrine of salvation and Antichrist stormed about eschatology. In both of these treatises, as well as others like them, we see much the same as we did in the previously discussed works. In the marrow of true justification, Keech once again, again reads the Old Testament for doctrinal definition and coherence, typological and covenantal structure, Christological referent, and tropological immediacy. One particularly interesting example of how he reads the Old Testament Christologically and doctrinally and ecclesiologically all at once is his use of Song of Solomon 4, verse 7. Quote, Thou art all fair, my love, and there is no spot in thee. That's in the King James. He quotes this text to argue that Christians, and here I'm quoting him, are justified and accepted as just persons and graciously acquitted by the righteousness of Christ, there should be the least stain, imperfection, or spot in our justification, but that Christ must needs say of such in respect of justification as he doth of his spouse, and then he quotes, Thou art all fair, my love, and there is no spot in thee. And I just want to pause there for a second and just let us sit with that. He's using Song of Solomon 4, where the groom is describing the, the bride and saying there's no spot in you, my bride, as a doctrinal 
support for justification by faith alone through Christ's imputed righteousness. That's how Keats uses the Old Testament. He also, for instance, lists Ezekiel 16.8 as a scriptural proof of the claim that the baptismal covenant binds believers to the Lord's care. Thus, while Keech is more concerned in this text with doctrinal polemics and construction than he is with covenantal, typological, Christological, and tropological readings, he still employs the same reading strategies that we saw in other works. Uh, with respect to Keech's eschatology, one aspect worth mentioning is his millenarianism. While the purpose of this paper doesn't allow us to go into detail about this aspect of Keech's thought, we should note that his use of the Old Testament in texts like Antichrist Stormed exhibit the same kind of immediacy regarding Scripture's audience, but with anagogy rather than tropology. The eschatological expectations of Scripture, in other words, are relevant to Keech's own time. A final doctrinal text we should mention in this section is one of his most well-known, well the glory and ornament of a true gospel church. We read this in my Baptist history class. It's read in a lot of Baptist history classes. Uh, this short treatise is concerned with church order or polity, and it therefore mostly cites the New Testament text concerned with polity. But Keech twice uses Old Testament texts to support his ecclesiological claims. In section 1.3, concerning the church's responsibility to examine those seeking membership before allowing them to join, Keech refers to two Old Testament texts, Isaiah 66, 16, and Jeremiah 50, verse 5. Later, and just to let you know what those say, Isaiah 66, For by fire will the Lord enter into judgment, and by his sword with all flesh, and those slain by the Lord shall be many. That's a text that he's using to support the idea that you should examine people before you allow them to join. Jeremiah 50, They shall ask the way to Zion with faces turned toward it, saying, Come, let us join ourselves to the Lord in an everlasting covenant that will never be forgotten. Again, this is a text used in support of examining people before allowing them to join as members. Later in section 2.2, which is on uh, of the work of a pastor, Keech says that, quote, A pastor is to visit his flock, to know their state, and to watch over them, to support the weak, and to strengthen the feeble-minded, and succor the tempted, and to reprove them that are unruly, end quote. In support of this description of the work of a pastor, Keech lists, uh, among a bunch of other New Testament texts, Proverbs 27, 23, which reads, quote, Know well the condition of your flocks, and give attention to your herds, for riches do not last forever, and does a crown endure to all generations? Keech makes no distinction between these Old Testament texts and the other New Testament texts he cites. He gives no indication that these are merely precursors to the ideas that are expressed in the New Testament. Rather, his use of these citations suggests that for Keech, the Old Testament speaks of and to the church on its own accord. Okay, so that's his doctrinal and catechetical works. Uh, the next two sections will be much briefer, uh, but we want to move on to his devotional works. So with respect to devotional works, Keech composed a number of allegories. So think uh, Pilgrim's Progress here. He, he wrote stuff like Pilgrim's Progress including a work called The Progress of Sin and another one called War with the Devil. At the beginning of Progress, Keech addresses his use of allegory, saying that he is, quote, "...presenting all I have said allegorically, which way I find the Holy Ghost by the prophets and the Lord Jesus himself much delighted in and made use of. For he spoke unto the multitude was by parables, etc. And indeed, had I not warrant from God's word thus to write, I should not presume so to do." Keech is, in other words, entirely comfortable with allegorizing precisely because he understands Scripture to use allegory in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. In this particular work, he allegorizes sin by fabricating an elaborate conversation between sin and Apollyon, in which the former instructs the latter on what sin is and who its enemies are and how to tempt believers and the like. In this regard, it is reminiscent of C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters. Throughout the work, Keech draws on a number of biblical stories, but two are particularly relevant here. First, he allegorizes Genesis 4 and elaborates on the idea that sin is, quote, crouching at Cain's door, fabricating a conversation between the two of them that is ultimately supposed to be instructive for Christians in Keech's own day. Second, he allegorizes and riffs on Noah's story, personifying sin and its reaction to God's flood judgment. 
Another allegorical devotional text, War with the Devil, also poses a discipleship-oriented conversation between two parties, youth and conscience. While it contains abundant biblical allusions, it does not draw on particular biblical texts in the same way as progress, and only does so in a much more muted fashion. Okay, so that's uh, in relation to his devotional works. Final section uh, of surveying his works is his hermeneutics, works on hermeneutics, his commentaries, and his sermons. Uh, we see the same kinds of use in his sermons, commentaries, and hermeneutical treatises. The volume of Keech's published material in this regard is daunting. He wrote a lot, he spoke a lot. And so here I will give examples from particular sermons and essays that fit the categories I've employed thus far, rather than working through different texts individually, as I've done in the previous section. In particular, I'm going to rely on a collection of sermons known as Gospel Mysteries Unveiled, which are, which are representative of, but not exhaustive, with respect to Keech's homiletical material. And if you want to look at more of Keech's sermons, you can see uh, his display of glorious grace, which is 14 sermons from Isaiah 54, A Golden Mind Opened, which is sermons from Matthew 3, John 10, and Hebrews 2, and Spiritual Songs, which is over 100 hymns uh, written by Keech. And of course, I would again point to Tropologia. So, with respect to these texts, once again, we see Keech assuming the unity of Scripture, particularly in a Christological sense, but also in ecclesial, covenantal, typological, moral, and eschatological senses. And, he th and, and this unity is a key element in his defense of doctrinal truth and coherence. For instance, in Sermon 16 of Gospel Mysteries Unveiled, which is called The Blind Leading the Blind and based on Luke 6.39, Keech uses Genesis 3.15, to defend Christ's full humanity against the arguments of the, quote, the, quote Arian, Socinians, and Caffeinites. That's a reference to Matthew Caffin. And I just want to, again, pause and say what he's doing is quoting the Proto-Evangelion, the, the, the initial gospel proclamation in Genesis 3.15, to argue for a Chalcedonian understanding of Christology. In Sermon 9, which is called The Saints, the Light of the World from Matthew 5.14, he cites Numbers 21.5 as teaching that light is, quote, taken sometimes for a thing of little value, end quote, and also refers to Judges 9.4 as an instance where it doesn't mean the same thing as a parable. In this way, Keish uses the Old Testament both to prove his point and also to show Scripture's varied but unified teaching. In other words, he's, he's looking at references to light in the Old Testament and saying that it lines up with what Matthew 5 teaches about the people of God. One of the most striking features of Keech's sermons is how he reads Old Testament texts as written about, for, and to believers throughout space and time. For instance, in Sermon 3, Every Valley Shall Be Filled, on Luke 3, 5, Keech cites Genesis 6, verse 5, as proof that all, quote, sinners' lusts have power over them, they have eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. In other words, the flood narrative isn't just about the sins of Noah's generation, but about the nature of fallen humanity. This kind of hermeneutical and tropological immediacy is seen again in Sermon 17, the parable of building a tower from Luke 14, 28-30, in which Keech uses Genesis 29, 31, and the fact that Jacob, quote, hated Leah, in comparison to his love for Rachel, to urge believers to hate all other things in comparison to our love for Christ. Just and Again, just let that sit for a minute. He's using this uh, patriarch's love for his first wife, Leah, or his hatred for his first wife, Leah, uh, and its, pale, its, its um, lack in comparison to his love for Rachel to tell believers to love Christ more than they love anything else. A few other examples of this kind of reading come in Sermon 21, the parable of the new wine from Matthew 9.17, wherein Keech argues that education cannot change the wicked's heart. The example Keech uses to prove this is Genesis 18.9 and Abraham's education of Ishmael. In the same sermon, quoting a, a Mr. Carl, he refers to Job 11-12 through 12 to support his assertion that man is like a beast for wantonness, lust, and vanity. And quoting Genesis 6.3, that his spirit should not always strive with man, Keech notes that converts must ask God the Spirit to give us a new heart and turn us from evil. Uh, one example of this hermeneutical immediacy that may be particularly strange, if these aren't strange enough, to modern readers is Keech's citation of Genesis 15, 10 and 11 in Sermon 23, the parable of the sower opened, which is from Matthew 8, 19. 
Here, the comparison made is between Abram being disturbed by birds while trying to offer the sacrifice and God's people being attacked by the enemy during worship. It is worth quoting Keech at length here to get an idea of how he reads the Old Testament as directly speaking to New Covenant believers. Here I'm quoting him. It is said when Abraham had killed his beasts, quote, an heifer of three years old and a she-goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon, the fowls came upon the carcasses and Abraham drove them away. Even so, these evil fowls or wicked spirits come down to disturb and disquiet the saints when they are in the discharge of holy duties, ritual sacrifices unto God, which they ought to drive away by a stout resistance of them in all their temptations through the assistance of the Spirit of God. Moreover, when the seed is newly sown, thither, thither it is observed oft times great multitudes of evil and hurtful fowls will resort, so that sometimes the ground is covered with them. So no doubt where the word of God and the assemblies of his people is powerfully preached, there are multitudes of those evil spirits who strive to catch up the seed, thereby to make a prey of the souls of such they may destroy. Keech reads this Old Testament story about birds bothering Abraham while he's making a sacrifice. And really the, the whole of the Old Testament, he reads it as a direct communication to the people of God throughout space and time for the sake of their sanctification. And so having surveyed these texts, what will we say in conclusion? Well, I'll say this. Uh, Benjamin Keach was a reformer and a credo Baptist. But he was also an Orthodox Christian, part of the small c Catholic, that is universal faith, once delivered, and a disciple of the great tradition. Perhaps nowhere is this more at odds with modern sensibilities than in his use of the Old Testament and his interpretation of Scripture more broadly. He reads like a reformer and a Baptist, in that he rejects Roman Catholic dogma, dogma regarding justification, as well as Roman and Protestant arguments for paedobaptism. In refuting the Roman view of justification and various forms of paedobaptism, and in arguing constructively for his respective reformational and credo-baptist views on those issues, he employs means of reading Scripture still used by many evangelicals today exegetical precision, lexical definition, inner biblical allusion, typological structure, and covenantal continuity. But Keech also draws on more Catholic, that is, small c, universally Christian ways of reading, reading strategies that many hermeneutics professors would find uncomfortable and even outright dangerous today. These include the Christological referent of any and all texts in the Old Testament, typologically connected elsewhere or not, it would include the tropological immediacy of the Old Testament, such that any and all Old Testament texts are written by the Holy Spirit to the people of God throughout space and time for their sanctification. And it would include an anagogical expectation in the Old Testament, such that any and all Old Testament texts point beyond themselves both to Christ's first coming and to his return in some fashion. Perhaps most troubling or exciting, depending on your view of things, is that Keech isn't afraid of allegory. In this way, we could argue that Keech is simply, again, small c Catholic reader of Scripture, employing all four senses, literal, allegorical, tropological, and anagogical, to understand any and all parts of Scripture. He is, of course, not Roman Catholic in his deployment of this hermeneutic, and there is much more to be said about that particular distinction. But for now, it's enough to say that Keech reads Scripture with the church Catholic as a book about Jesus and for his church. It is fitting to conclude with his prayer at the end of War with the Devil, a prayer that summarizes much of his theology and his hermeneutic. And so I would invite you uh, to pray with Benjamin Keach as he prays through Scripture here. Dear Savior, Son of Righteousness, not only shine on my poor heart, but through this world's wide wilderness, thy healing influence in part. O oh, let thy face upon them shine, for by creation all are thine. Let light and knowledge, Lord, abound, and thy blessed gospel far be spread. And whoso with thy truth confound, let them by it be converts made. O oh, let thy face on Zion shine, and bless that holy hill of thine. Let thy bright glory so break forth, and darkness fly from every land, that all the saints throughout the earth may in thy truth rejoicing stand. O oh, let thy face upon them shine, who by election, Lord, are thine. O 
Let every nation far and near thy pure unspotted light behold. From every error purge them clear, and thy rich gospel grace unfold. O let thy face upon them shine, for all the nations, Lord, are thine. Let all who bear the Christian name thy Holy Spirit, Lord, receive. Nor let thine enemies blaspheme the heavenly truths that we believe. O let thy face upon them shine, and on them set thy seal divine. Lord, carry on thy glorious work victoriously in every land. Let Tartar, pagan, Jew, and Turk submit themselves to thy command. O let thy face upon them shine, and gather these outcasts of thine. Thy light and truth, O Lord, send forth purposcuously through every land, that all from east, south, west, and north may humbly bow to thy command. O let thy face upon them shine, that all may own thy power divine. Set up thy king on Zion's hill, upon his father David's throne. Thine ancient promises fulfill, made to thine own eternal son. O let thy face forever shine upon his seed, thy chosen line. Remember Abram, Lord thy friend, and pity Jacob's chosen race. Open their eyes, thy spirit send, and let them taste thy promised grace. O let thy face in mercy shine upon that ancient flock of thine. Give now the kingdom to thy son, or all the globe his trophies spread. Let Jews and Gentiles all in one be brought to him, their living head. O let thy face upon them shine, for Jews and Gentiles all are thine. And so thus all the praise shall be to thee great parent of the universe, whose mercy sets the prisoner free, whose light the darkest clouds disperse. For heaven and earth shall both combine and shout, All glory, Lord, is thine. Amen.